Okay, so welcome everybody. This is the this is the last DSG seminar for this calendar year, anyways. And uh, thanks, as usual, to our um, sponsors at SAP. Hopefully, some of them are actually here um, for the talk as well. Um, Aaron Elmore is the speaker today, um, talking about Crocodile DB. So I sent his bio around already, but he's a graduate of UCSB. He worked with. Um, D.B. Agarwal and Amr el -Abadi. while he was there. Um, then he did a postdoc at MIT, and since then he's been at Chicago. And um, I was remembering that he's been here before, like physically to Waterloo to give a talk. Um, I think Kuzaima just tracked it down to about five years ago. So some of you who've been here for a while may remember him from that. And um, for the rest of you, um, I'm glad you'll get a chance to see uh, Aaron. So go ahead. Thanks, Kim. And then please interrupt if there's questions. Uh, for those of you that were there five years ago, I go fast. <laughs> if you need me to, to pause and reflect or explain something differently, just go ahead and say something. I'm in the full screen mode, so I can't see hands or, or chats. So you're just going to have to unmute and, and yell. Great. So thanks, Ken. Okay, great. So I'm going to talk about Crocodile DB. So I want to first, you know, get, get us started with a story uh, uh, about a guy named Vlad. And I'm, I'm sure a couple of you did hear that the U.S. Uh, had an election uh, pretty recently here. And so Vlad's going to tell a story about Vlad and the election here. So Vlad uh, is in advertising and uh, he's, he spent a lot of his money on budgets on Facebook ads, right? And this was all about as we're kind of leading up to, to uh, the election, he spent all of his money on there, right? And when the election you know, night turned into election week, Vlad was just basically running out of money to keep his dashboard up to date. You know, all of these kind of expensive cloud databases, he was trying to pull in all this data from Twitter and from various kind of polling stations and from county boards and just basically head out of his budget. So, and this was largely due to the, the eagerness and pulling all this data in. So what happened is Vlad couldn't afford to keep things up to date. You know, he just basically ran out of money and had to start turning things off. So Vlad got very sad, right? And it wasn't just that Vlad was sad that he, he ran out of money to keep his, his reports up to date. He was sad because his favorite candidate lost the election. Um, so, you know, I know if we were in the person, everyone would be clapping right now, but it's all right. Um, so great. And so this got me thinking, right? So, you know, Vlad's story got me thinking that databases are pretty eager. You know, if you have a batch system, a traditional kind of SQL database, as soon as you give it the query, the database is going to basically do everything it can do to get you that answer as fast as possible. If we were in a system that was a stream system or an, you know, an immediate view system, for the most of the part, as soon as new data or a small set of data comes in, the database is going to do everything it can do to answer those queries or update those results as fast as possible. And you know, this eager execution model, especially faced with kind of how data just keeps growing, is problematic in, in a number of domains. Uh, in one case, like for Vlad, it's this cloud or serverless or pay per use model, that eagerness, that eager execution results in you spending more money. If you're in a place where you have a fixed amount of resources, like a hybrid environment where you're doing transactions and analytics or you're sharing it between machine learning workloads, that eagerness is taking away from resources that other people could be using for other tasks. If you're running on an edge or a mobile device, right, that eager execution actually results in power drain and therefore you can actually kill a battery faster. And you know, data center usage is contributing in large parts to you know carbon emissions. So there is a concern about is this eagerness actually going to be good for the environment? So you know, is that execution a good thing? And lastly, you know, everyone has very limited attention. There's a lot of data coming through, and so that eager execution might result in something that somebody's not even be able to look at because they're they're busy browsing the web or doing something else, right? And if we go back to thinking about kind of Vlad's scenario here, we're really thinking about a case for what we're gonna target is a case where we have kind of data coming in, there's kind of a constant stream of data, it's largely inserts, but we have the ability to we'll think about deletes and updates as well. And we have some regular queries that are being executed. And these regular queries are being associated with some kind of trigger condition. So it could be time here. So you know, maybe we have some reports that are running daily. We have some up to the minute reports. We have hourly reports or whatever. And so data is constantly coming in. And we're thinking about environments where I want to monitor this data with some regular queries. And so when we think about this, this is kind of question. Nope, just the microphone blip. OK. So if we want to think about this, what we're going to be looking at largely is we're going to assume that we have some form of a scheduled query. And so again, this is because it's regular. So we have a query and we know at the future we're going to execute this query. We're going to have some records coming in between that time of when we know the query should start, you know, before basically the query is going to execute. And our context of what we're going to think about for latency here is going to be once I have all of the data for this particular query and I start the query, how long does it take to get the result, right? And that's going to be our latency here. 
And what a lot of work thus far has been concerned with is how do I basically shorten that latency? How do I take that latency and cut it down, right? And this is going to be, you know, commonly done. And this is going to basically come in this terms of this trade-off, right? If I have latency on one hand and I want to lower the latency, I'm going to lower that latency usually by using more resources. And this is most commonly done through some form of eager execution, right? So as that data is coming in, I'm going to think about how do I take that data that's coming in and start working on the result eagerly. And this is most notably been in systems like streaming systems or continuous query systems, which I'll say is CQ systems, or historically kind of immediate incremental view maintenance systems, right? So an incremental view maintenance system is I have the result, the view, it's materialized, and I'm going to think about as I get new records, how do I take those records and kind of incorporate them into the result? So I have a join, I get some new records, how do I figure out how to take these records and put them into the join? And a lot of this is done, you know, this resource consumption comes from both CPU, the work to take that data and get it in there, and also kind of consumes memory and other kind of uh, resources. These are the two main things we're going to talk about today is CPU and memory, but there's clearly a lot more on the machine. Right? The other end of the spectrum is kind of these batch systems or these lazy systems that wait to basically I have all the data. I'm going to execute the query once I have all of that data. And therefore I'm going to use less resources because I'm not doing something eagerly, but it's gonna come at the cost of higher latency. Right? I'm gonna wait till I have it, I'm gonna do the work and then it's gonna take a little bit longer. And for this work, we're really interested in what is what exists in this middle ground. And in particular, we're thinking about kind of not like up to the millisecond results, but near real time results. So, you know, if I know somebody is giving me a query that I want the result every hour, maybe we know that we have a couple of minutes to get the answer after the hour. Um, or if it's every minute, I have 20 seconds, right? So things that are near real time, but there's a little bit of slack that we can play with to do this. And so we're not at this kind of batch mode. We're not at this continuous query mode. We're thinking about what's in the middle here. And in particular, because we're talking about resources, this is going to all be about resource efficiency. So how do I figure out what's in this middle ground? And how do I either say, can I use the same amount of resources and drop the latency? Or can I keep the same kind of goal latency and lower the resource consumption? And that's what I talk about when I mean resource efficient databases. I think about what's in this middle ground, kind of how do we push this curve down as much as possible to say, let's provide good performance that the user expects while trying to minimize our resource utilization. Now, databases have been, you know, uh, yes. Yeah, so um, quick question, probably more of clarification, but um, so, so, I mean, I, I understand the two sort of extremes, right? Lazy and eager. Yep. Um, but when you when you say near, um, you know, eager or near lazy or, or you know, near real uh, time, is this kind of defined by the application or do you have some like a, a a more crisp notion of what near real time means. Yeah, I'll, I'll get into it. It's good. It's going to be a little bit vague, but we're going to assume that it's kind of uh, defined by the application. So here it's going to be, um, I'll give a couple examples, but maybe somebody says, you know, here I want this query. Uh, I'm going to have this query regular and I'd like the answer within five minutes. Uh, okay. We're going to get into a, a little bit of a definition that's a little bit wonky, but it helps for experiments where, where somebody's going to give us it as a proportion of batch. So if I was to execute this query by itself, I wanted to run in half the time as batch, things like that. But I'll, I'll get into it. But yeah, okay. there's a little, I'm, I'm being intentionally vague here. But yeah, right. Okay. And then Thanks. somebody accidentally drew on the screen. <laughs> if they could erase their, their blue mark, <laughs> that would be helpful. I haven't had this issue yet, but yeah. Um, so the blue line in the middle is not me. Um, great, so that's where we're at. So what have databases done thus far uh, to help improve resources? Uh, you know really kind of at the core databases have, have really been about like, how do I minimize resource consumption when I'm doing query planning or you're doing things like caching? And that's really about like, you know, I'm, I have a plan, I'm trying to figure out how to make the plan run as fast as possible. And thus I'm gonna try to like minimize my IO utilization or, you know, you know whatever kind of resources, because there's a, there's a correlation between query execution and resource consumption. Most, I think going to be in line with things that we're thinking about is the spirit of kind of shared scans or shared queries. And this is all about, you know, killing two birds with one stone. I have, uh, you know, queries that overlap. I'm going to potentially run them together. They might not perfectly overlap. And because they don't perfectly overlap, uh, I might actually add some latency to this. And, but by adding this latency to each of these queries, I'm actually, in theory, reducing my overall resource utilization of the system. There's been a whole lot of work on approximate query processing or approximate hardware, which is maybe I'm going to look at less data and get you the result, which obviously improves resource efficiency. I'm not going to do anything in the realm of ATP. And clearly things like virtualization or multi-tenancy, but here I'm trying to improve the overall resource utilization of the machine. 
uh, is going to be a case. Um, and, and we're not gonna think about that either here. I'm going to be thinking about single users. And then other cases like hardware acceleration or other kind of tasks that allow you to kind of have more specialized operators that, that are better resources. So these are kind of things that have been done and we're gonna to try to scope out a new space that's a little bit more similar to shared SANS where we're gonna think about you know, timing information and how do I do things to kind of improve the overall performance. Um, great. Uh, I don't think I can delete this annotation here. I'm going to take a quick second and see if I can clear the screen. Clear all drawings. Great, I can do it. Good. Okay, now let me get back out. Okay, good. All right, so the vision for this is we want to basically build a new system that exploits timing and performance objectives in order to improve resource utilization. So this is that time stuff. And we're going to do it through a couple of mechanisms. I'll talk about two of them today. And here we're thinking about how do I take overall kind of resource utilization, holistically integrate it through the whole system, and we're going to rely heavily on predictive models in order to do this. So that's Crocodile DB. That's our project. Um, you know, the name's inspired by crocodiles. If you've watched kind of specials of you know Nat Geo or, or whatever, where you see a crocodile hunt, uh, it's inspired by how a crocodile kind of sits very still until it's going to attack, and then it pounces very fast at the last minute. It doesn't kind of thrash or run or chase. Um, I wouldn't use the word lazy, but I'd say efficient in this case. Um, you know, everyone here is in Waterloo, a similar climate to us in Chicago. You might think, what do you know about crocodiles? Well, you know, pre-pandemic back, you know, it feels like a thousand years ago uh, in Chicago, we actually had a chance the snapper that was running around the Chicago park that caused uh, a lot of stir. So that kind of helped us uh, think about naming this thing Crocodile DB. But this is it. So Crocodile DB, we, we, you know, there's a lot of kind of high level goals. You know, we thought about what are the opportunities that we have for trading off resources and performance? How do we allow users to specify those performance requirements? So that ties into some of this question earlier. Uh, what are the kind of signals that come into the system to allow us to inform decisions? And then how do we, you know, at the key of this is how do we integrate resource efficient mechanisms or policies throughout various components in the system? And I'll talk today in particular about query execution in a lot of ways, right? So what are the physical mechanisms? How do we figure out what knobs are available? And how do we tune those knobs to allow us to basically have this right trade-off of performance and resource utilization? And this is kind of our high level view of Crocodile DB. I'll talk about you know, the high level components, which are we think are kind of new changes to overall database system designs that we'll need. On the bottom is just our basic storage tiers. I'll talk about that for a minute. In the middle are these various components that we've been building. And I'll talk about two of these components today. So the storage components on the bottom are we're thinking about, of course, we have our, our traditional base tables, which are just basically the, the data in this regular old tuple form, everything that we think about when we think about you know, databases. We're obviously going to have a strong emphasis on materialized views. So here we're going to be generating results, keeping those results around and using those results a lot. And um, I'll get into it in a second here, but we're also going to be thinking about materialized views in terms of I have a result, you want to query that result, I'm going to give you that result, but we're also thinking about for people that want to have those kind of regular queries, like every five minutes, give me an answer. Uh, we're building mechanisms that we can just give people the differences from the prior execution. So we don't necessarily have to say the same thing or what we return to the user might be different. We've been thinking a lot about raw data and I won't talk about it too much today. Uh, and I know if there's folks from SIP on the line, they've been doing some of this, it also appeared at CIDR, um, that we're thinking about basically you know, what can we do to kind of help alleviate some of the work on getting the data into the system? And, and part of this is going to be, we want to take raw data in from the client when we have bulk loading, non-transaction loading, and we want to try to keep it raw as long as possible because getting that conversion from raw into the data is expensive. And so we want to, we've been thinking about how do we defer that? And these are projects I'm happy to talk with somebody about later, but it's not gonna be too much right now. And then we're thinking about also if we go from raw into what people have called historically delta log. So we have some data that's been parsed, validated, and it hasn't necessarily been integrated into base tables or materialized views, but it's more or less ready to be queried, which is you know, similar to what a lot of systems do. So the policies and requirements that we think are, that are changed or need to be changed from traditional database systems are, well, clearly we're going to need differences in how people give queries. So this is going to be extensions to SQL or, or kind of uh, ways to allow people to specify um, execution intervals. So, you know, here's a query. I want this run every five minutes for the next 30 minutes. Or here's this query, make the chain, you know, update the results when there's a thousand new tuples or when the query result changes by some threshold. And then also, like I said a second ago, specifying how should the output look? Should it be giving me the full result every time or just the differences? So these are small changes to you know, uh, traditional how queries come in and how they get registered and how they execute. 
we're thinking a lot about performance objectives. And so this kind of ties into that the question earlier about, you know, how, how can we do this? And so we, you know, might imagine that people give, you know, hard timing requirements, which is tricky. Um, we might think something about can we actually infer what performance requirements are because maybe somebody sets up a, a batch job that runs at midnight, but through the system we can see that nobody ever reads it till eight in the morning. And so in this case we might be able to infer a performance requirement. And like I, what we'll do for a lot of this work is, is basically building a knob. And this knob is basically, you know, one is batch. And if I want it to go faster than batch, I start to turn the knob up and get the smaller number. So 0.5 would be running half the time of batch execution or whatever. So this is just going to kind of be a, a fuzzy knob. This part, you know, we're, we're actively working on how do we kind of expose this to the user and allow the user to kind of understand what these different things mean. So uh, we have a, had a demo at VLDB where if you had this knob and you expose this knob, could you show the user what the expected latency would look like? Now, I, I'm sure a lot of people in here know getting real hard latency is a really tough thing to do with database systems. There's interference, there's, there's statistical errors. Uh, so these are going to be kind of uh, best effort goals. We're not, we're not going to be building kind of hard performance for those. As you'll get into uh, in this talk, we'll, we're going to rely heavily on, on the ability to predict where data is coming in and how data is going to change. So we're going to be able to say something like, hey, table X is going to get a thousand new tuples in the next hour. And we're going to rely heavily on this information of where data is going to change in order to be informed to make good decisions. And lastly, because this is all about resource allocation, is a lot of what we're doing is thinking about how do we take Com existing components and allow them to have a, basically a better integration and a more adaptive use of resource allocation. In my opinion, database systems tend to be pretty static with this. So I set up a database, I give it this amount of memory for buffer pool, I give it this amount of working memory for each query operator, you know, this is how much memory I can use for hash runs or whatever, and it's kind of sit and it goes. What we're trying to build out is a system that allows the system to be flexible with this and saying, hey, this query is going to run and you have this, many, this much resources to run, right? And there's this inherent understanding that that's a trade-off between performance and, and speed, but we want this allocation and control to be more tightly built into the whole system. So Great. Aaron, can I ask yes. you a question? Great, perfect. So, so are you just trying to expose a performance knob or are you also trying to expose cost? So in other words, if, I'm, if I dial that knob, am I, are you gonna give me some idea of what I could save? Great, yeah, that would be, a, I think a perfect thing if someone was running in a cloud-based environment that we could yep. translate these numbers to a hard dollar. Yep. Uh, right now, what, what I'm going to show, at least for the second part of the talk, is we, we translate it into basically tuples, like whatever the cost model internally uses, is that's our number, right? So if it's tuples processed, then you have some, you know, adjuster of CPU for that. So the hope is that if it was something like CPU, and let's say you're on like a, a serverless environment, that if you had a cost per record that flows through the system or function invocation or whatever, that we could then translate that to cost. Right. If it was a bit more of a complex system like Azure and maybe you had like IO costs and things, it would get start to be a little bit more there. But as long as we had a way of tying cost to whatever the internal optimizer is using, then we could give that as a cost function. So because the cool thing about the cool thing about the cloud, right, is that um, it has a very concrete cost model that might actually make it easier for you to do that, right? I mean, they they are exposing sort of exactly what you're being billed for what operations. Right. Yeah. So depends on the cloud though, right? If you think about SQL Azure, right? It, like the the uh, t-shirt sizes as they call it, I find like their database transaction unit to be incredibly big. Right. Like how much performance do you get? <laughs> like is like this weird thing. Like, how do I take that and understand like how does this impact my performance? I have this, you know, and I know under the hood they're translating that into IO requests and things. Right. But I feel like for that mapping from that to a workload isn't always clear. Yeah, fair enough. In a serverless environment. I, it's actually, I think, more clear, right? You're paying for some function invocation when you do it. And I know people are trying to build databases on serverless. It's great. Right. And then if you're on an infrastructure, you have it. Or if you're on like uh, RDS, you have it, but you're paying like per request. But there isn't this knob of like, hey, I'm actually okay with things being slower if you could cut my cost down. But yeah, that's totally what we would like to have is to allow the user to say like, this is the performance getting, this is the amount of things I am spending to get that. And I want to play with that number. Like I, I want things to be faster. How much more is it going to cost me? That would be our end. That would be the ideal end case. Um, but you know, we're not building this inside of AWS, so it, it's harder. But but we, yeah, 100%. That's what we want. Right. Great. Thanks.
And I think that's one of the most uh, compelling use cases that people can at least grab onto. Like if I tell people like, oh, we can save 50% of your CPU, like, okay, great. <laughs> Did I need that CPU or not? But if I can tell somebody, look, I can save you, you know, $5,000 a month, then they might be more excited. Cool. Uh, other questions at this point at high level, because I'm going to dive into one particular project now. So if there's any other kind of higher level uh, questions, it's a great time for it. Awesome. Okay. So I'm going to start off talking about one particular project here, uh, the intermittent query processing. This appeared in last two VLDBs ago, so 2019, uh, when we actually got to go somewhere and be in person. Um, and so this is going to be in a context related I'll talk about in a second. And then just to kind of help set the stage. So our vision has been building this as a holistic system. We started off with building this as this IQP prototype. This is going to be in PostgreSQL. We ripped apart PostgreSQL to get this to work and found that this was a nightmare building this out inside of Postgres. Uh, largely has to do with kind of maintaining results in Postgres and in kind of how to, how to maintain data. So we threw that away and the later project will be in Spark. We've ripped apart Spark pretty heavily and built that in Spark. Um, and we've actually now decided we're not too thrilled with doing this in Spark. So we're now on our third iteration of building this out and we're going it from the ground up, building a system from scratch in Rust, uh, just to allow us to give us the controls and the knobs that we want everywhere. Uh, so it's going to be Postgres and then in Spark, uh, but and largely it's just due to like we did this and found that X, Y, and Z did not really work in the system. In order to get those things to work in the system, it would be more work than what we want to do as uh, researchers. So IQP, we're again in this context of maintaining a standing, qu standing a query, and we're thinking about resource consumption and latency. And so if you want high resource consumption and high latency, we're going to go for a system like Hadoop, which no one would do. Again, if we want low latency and high resource consumption, CQ IVM systems, and this is again, we're going to keep a lot of state around from the query, things like hash tables or sorted outputs. Uh, if we want to have high latency, again, we'll do a deferred systems where basically you just throw away everything that you did and you start over. And this is what PostgreSQL does for view maintenance. You set up a view in Postgres, you give it some records, you give it a query, you change the record, it throws away everything and starts over from scratch. And then what we want to be here for this project is low query latency and low resource consumption, but obviously there's no free lunch. So we're gonna to have to do this by exploiting particular things here. In particular, what we're going to exploit is cases where we have kind of intermittent but predictable data arrival. So imagine we have this case, where we have a, a query. This query is going to uh, periodically give updates on the results and we have various amounts of data that's going to come in. So on the Y axis, the higher the point, the more data. So imagine we have a lot of the data already there I'm going to execute the first query. It takes some time. The red bar is our latency and I give the result. So the user's happy, they see a result. And then over time, we kind of have this long tail of data coming in and maybe it's coming in in chunks. And then based on some condition, timing, record count, whatever, we know we have to periodically maintain the result and give the user an updated result, right? So at these, every you know thousand records, 10,000 records, 10 minutes, whatever, I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna go and update that, that result. I'm gonna say, here's the total now result for this, all of this data that you have. So for this particular project, we're thinking about, well, what do you do in the downtime? What happens when you're idling? And for these two extremes, the CQ system or this batch system, you know, if it's like a CQ or IVM system, effectively what systems do is they basically keep the entire query plan just revved and running, right? I just keep all of the state around as I get new records. I just basically start, you know, propagating those records through the system. I might batch up hundred records at a time or do something like that, but it's still basically constantly running and everything, all that state is there. These deferred systems basically throw everything away and then just basically re-execute it. So what we're gonna do in this project is clearly gonna be in the middle ground here. And what we're thinking about is after I've executed this query, can I pick some particular state from a query plan and keep that around such that when I want to restart the result, can I just reuse what I've kept? And if I do a good job of picking the right things, can I do less work? So it's about what can I keep from the query such that I can kind of shrink the state of the query down. I'm going to do nothing in this idle time. And then when I refresh, can I use that selective state that I've kept in order to give you a fast refresh at that point in time? And that's kind of this high level goal of IQP or intermittent query processing. I want to take queries that are registered, you know, that have some periodicity of when they're being um, refreshed. I have the ability to predict where data is coming in. And I want to be able to give some resources to the system that allows it to figure out how much can it keep when it's idle. Right now, I'm not interested at all when I'm executing. I just want to think, well, what can I keep when it's idle such that I can kind of minimize my resource utilization both in the idle time and then hopefully by picking the right things I can do less work on the refresh. So we're going to take a plan in. We're going to take, uh, we're going to take query in, get our plan. We execute the result. We have some state. We're going to think about what state do I throw away. 
And then as I get new data, what we'll call as a delta data comes in, how do I take that state I kept, use IVM algorithms and be able to update that result with the, that new data? And I'll go through a few examples and make this more clear. So it's all about picking the right state subject to some memory budget. Now we need to have predictions on where data is coming. And in particular, we need to know which tables are going to have new records. And for each of these tables, how many records are going to come in. The first one is much more important than the second one here. We really need to know which tables are going to come in. And this example will hopefully explain why. So imagine I have a simple hash join between R and S. I build a hash table on S and then I probe records from R against that hash table and emit them. Well, imagine I've executed this and now later I want to update th this result with new records. If you were to tell me that only new records are going to come from R, then keeping that hash table is great. I get a few new records from R, I can pick them up, I can probe them against the hash table, and I can emit the result. Everybody's happy. But if you were to tell me that only new records are going to come from S, well, that hash table is totally useless. Because now for all of those new records I get from S, I have to basically rescan all of R to find the result. So if you were to tell me, hey, I need to do this join between R and S, and then later only data is likely to come from S, well, you might want to do something different, like not do just a regular hash join, but you might want to do something like a symmetric hash join, where you build hash tables on both sides. And therefore, when I get new records from S, I can probe that hash table from R, and I can emit the result. Right? This will make the delta processing uh, a bit faster, but it could slow down the actual query execution, because now I have to do hash tables on both sides. But this is the information that we need in order to make these decisions. So we built a component called DIS, which is Delta Oriented Intermediate State Selector. So this is saying I have uh, some state I want to keep. I have some deltas coming in, which thing should I keep? And we're thinking about, well, can I keep state that was materialized in the original plan, like a hash table? Can I think about output that was pipelined into an operator, but there was no materialization. So I can inject some form of thing like materialize. This says capture everything and just save it as, a, as, a, as you know, an output. It could be sorted, an array, a table, whatever. Or can I change the execution plan in some way that allows me to generate new state that semantically preserves the same operations, but capture something that wasn't there, like adding a new hash table inside of it? So this is thinking, I have these options. We're going to take a plan. We're going to modify it that allows us to do these things to, to help make this um, uh, IQP scenario work. So we have a query. We plug it into Postgres's vanilla optimizer. We get a plan that comes out. We take this plan, and we take the predictions of where new data is coming in. We take the how much memory do I have to keep it. We give it to this. And this is going to give us two things. It's going to give us this updated query plan that could have this, these change hash joins or you know, materialized operators injected into it. And then it's also going to say, after you execute, make sure you keep these things around. So keep this materialized operator and keep this hash table around. So afterward, we can do this fast refresh. We take this updated plan, we execute the query, we run through it and we keep that selected state around. Then later, when we have new data that comes in, we've modified Postgres's execution engine to say, I can take that data and basically incrementally incorporate it into the result and give the result afterward. So here, if I had a new record from uh, T or a set of records, I can join it against the materialized output, take that output, probe the hash table, and do it, and so forth. Right? And that's what we're doing. So here, by picking the right state, we can minimize the execution work for that refresh on the deltas, and we can use less memory while we're doing that. And so here, the goal of this is basically trying to minimize the time for those deltas and minimizing the time for creating that new state. I won't get into the details here, but effectively, we're going to do this using a dynamic programming solution. So here, you can imagine we have an operator and a subtree, and we're basically trying to select between, do I keep this state, do I throw away this state, or do I build some new state? And we have to account for, basically, when I use this state, I consume memory, so there's less uh, you know, capacity for the child. And potentially, there's some computation differences, both for the original query and for the deltas. And so here, we kind of go through and we do a top-down solver with basic optimizations. I'm just going to wave my hands through that one. Uh, so here we, we have a bunch of support for uh, you know key operators, sorting, aggregation, join, select, project, materialize. We have the ability to support deletes, updates, and inserts from the base tables. And uh, you know we, we have both in the, the paper, we have a plan for I have one delta or I have a series of deltas. And how do we make that dynamic programming solver work for kind of a chain of deltas together? So like I said before, we built this inside of PostgreSQL. In this first pass, we only had support for flat queries, so select, project, join, aggregate queries. 
We're going to run this on TPCH, so that gives us about half of the queries. We did this on a, on a pretty large machine, moderately large. We're going to compare against a couple of things. We're going to do against Postgres's default strategy, which is rebatch, which is throw everything away and start over from scratch. And then at the time that we started this, what we viewed as one of the state of the arts uh, kind of uh, incremental view maintenance systems is called DB Toaster. Uh, this is basically how do I take data and constantly kind of update data for uh, getting a fast result. And this works by hand waving here, uh, maintaining higher order views. So if I had a table that I know, let's say involved R, S, and T, I'm going to basically generate different permutations of joins between these and maintain these joins such that when I have to get the query, I figure out where do I pull that data from. So this was designed for basically, I got data coming in fast. I'm gonna do a lot of work, but it allows me to do a very fast refresh. We're gonna compare against DB Toaster in two ways. We're gonna compare against it, it's raw native code that, you know, it's uh, the Scala version, I believe, right? or the C++ version, I just blinked there, uh, but basically a binary that they give. And then we also have a case where we take DB Toaster's plan that they give and we port it over to PostgreSQL and we execute against it with the same execution engine. So we get more of an apples to apples comparison. So that'll be like a DB Toaster Postgres. And so these are gonna be the things that we're gonna compare against. We're gonna look at two kind of scenarios here. Or say under an intermittent workload where I have kind of a few intervals, how do we compare against rebatch and DB Toaster and Postgres and raw DB Toaster? And then as we kind of restrict our memory budget, how do we do uh, against those and then uh, baselines? And then in addition, we'll look at some work from the DB team on Recycler, which was a greedy view cache algorithm, where basically they kind of try to associate the utility or the cost of building some state. And do I keep that state around based on how expensive was it to, to do that? So that, that's what we're going to compare against. So for this first scenario, we're going to look at kind of this notion of late data processing for TPCH. We're going to assume that our first query is going to execute when I have 90% of the data. Then we're going to get a series of three deltas where each of these deltas is progressively getting smaller. And we're going to uh, not give deltas to the nation and region, but every other table in TPCH will have data. Uh, we're going to start off with no memory budget, and I'll show a memory budget in a second. And here I'm going to report the total query processing time. So for the four queries here, the initial and then the three deltas, and then we'll look at the memory consumption. So again, these are the flat queries for uh, TPCH, uh, lower being better because we're measuring latency here. So across the board for these queries, we see DIS, which is that selection component for ITP, has the lowest query time for almost all queries. Query like query six, we do slightly worse than DB Toaster and Postgres. We set up a 500 second timeout. And so what we find is a lot of cases here that DB Toaster is very uh, either native or in Postgres does not finish within 500 seconds. And these are just queries that have a lot of tables. So maintaining those higher order views gets very expensive for the system to do. So it takes a long time. And surprisingly, in some cases, actually throwing everything away and starting over from scratch like query nine, rebatch actually can work better than DB Toaster here. So I think this highlights a couple of things, right? This highlights that this it's not always clear of eager versus lazy, depending on kind of the query and the intervals and the amount of data. But we think here, this is demonstrating that by being intelligent about what you keep, you can keep the latency down. And then also by looking at how much memory do we consume here, we're just gonna look at what disk selects versus what DB Toaster and Postgres selects is that we're able to do much less memory consumption because we're doing a better job of figuring out what to keep around where DB Toaster's algorithm is designed to kind of be very eager and excessively compute a lot of state here. So now, Aaron, in that previous graph is the time, the total time for the four queries? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's the initial and then this. Now I'll show one for just a refresh in a second. Um, and I have backup slides if we want to break them down, but this is the aggregate across all four. Cool. So here we're seeing that we use much less memory, uh, which is in theory going to be happy. So I think this is a slightly more interesting result here. So here, this is one query. We did the initial query execution with 99% of the data, and I'm going to show the latency for a single delta. So just the 1% delta. Same case, deltas for all tables except nation and region. And here we want to look at basically what happens as I restrict the memory or grow the memory. So this is just the latency for the delta here. So if I have no memory, basically, you know, DIS uh, is dynamic programming solution or DIS using the recycler project, which is that greedy view algorithm kind of integrated in our system is going to have the same performance as rebatch because I can't keep anything around. I basically have to go over from scratch. As I start to give memory, both uh, DIS is dynamic programming and DIS recycler do, does a better job. But as I start to scale up that memory, basically DIS is able to do a better job than recycler because it's able to figure out what state is more likely to be valuable given a model of where data is going to come here. It's not necessarily just looking at the cost of things, but it's thinking about 
where is the data going to change? And so here we're able to do a better job than Recycler. And I think most interesting you see on the, the x-axis, there's this jump from three and a half to 17. This is how much memory does DB Toaster and Postgres need to work? So with less than 17 and a half gigs, DB Toaster uh, in Postgres can't do anything. So I think this shows that it, it, our method is also scalable here and it kind of gracefully degrades as you give it memory. So IQP is all about what sits in between kind of batch and continuous queries. When I have data coming in kind of bursts and I wanna periodically refresh that result, we wanna think about if you could take that intermittent predictable data, could you figure out basically what should I keep that allows me to reduce the memory consumption of that query when it's not running and if I do a good job of picking the right state, then I have to do less work on the refresh because I can basically process less things in that query plan. So by doing so, we hope that we can reduce latency and also therefore it reduces CPU consumption because I, I do less things. So this is this first step that we had in trying to build towards a, a resource efficient component. I'm gonna switch gears in a second unless there's any questions on IQP. Hi, Aaron, this is Sammy. <clears throat> Sammy, good to see you. See you. Uh, so you, so so what you showed had a few um, essentially optimizations that you're doing, and one of them is keeping state. So I've I've got a, one question about that, and the other one is sometimes you're changing the plan. Uh, so when you change the plan, I've got a question about both. So first, in terms of changing the state, other than hash tables. Uh, you said you could keep the output of certain operators. How do you decide that? That's number one. Uh, the second thing is for when you change the operator, do you have any other operators that you change other than you just show the symmetric hash table? Are there other operators that you change? Great. So uh, the first question is how do we calculate the cost? Well, you're asking how do we calculate the cost? No, how do you, so, so, so I understand keeping around the hash tables. Yeah. That example I understood, but yeah. how do you decide, for example, whether the output of a filter, a scan filter, a scan should be kept around? Great, great, great. Basically, so when we're doing this dynamic programming, if we're at that, like an operator that's above the filter, we think about basically, could I inject a materialize underneath? So the, because the filter is pipeline, right? So there's no state associated with it. So the output of capturing that would be to say, put a, put a materialize in between the output of the filter and the parent. And so the, the dynamic programming is going to consider that as an option when we're considering that operator. So okay, by so doing that we effective. Uh -huh. So does this keeping around usually capture selective filters? Is yeah, this yeah. That, so that's one case it's going to get. So the, great. So this kind of, I think, part of your other questions, like what are the other options? Is, so we have a selective filter. You have a sort operator, right? So there's basically some large amount of work that went into getting to that point of data. But because of whatever, that there's not a lot of state associated with it, right? So that materializes the way of capturing that state that's not there. Um, so does that answer the first part of the question? Yeah, I think that okay. answers the first one. And then the second part, there's it, it's 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 joins and um, in aggregations is one, right? We could do a sort-based aggregation, do a hash-based aggregation. Okay. And then a lot of it is going to be injecting materialization into it. Uh, but and then and so I, I can show it later, it's at the end, but we do have this case of like, what if we built IQP and didn't have materialize? Or what if we built IQP and didn't allow us to change different types of joins or change joins operators? And then we kind of show how they stack up and each one of them kind of contributes some portion kind of equal to each other. So also just one final comment. In, in, in terms of the baseline, it looks like there's in this space of baselines, there's one other baseline, which is what uh, differential data flow is doing. So what Frank McSherry's materialized system is doing, which is they are also eager but they're a lot more efficient than DB Toaster because yeah. DB Toaster keeps crazy amounts of data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It keeps all the essentially second order, third order, fourth order. It's yeah, yeah, unreasonable yeah. amount of data. And it's only <laughs> really optimized for these aggregation, numeric aggregations. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is differential data, flow, which it would be interesting to see how they do. 100%. Certainly, they, they would use more memory, but uh, in terms of performance, I, I, I don't, I can't predict. Yeah, 100%. And that's why I, I tried to be subtle with it. But that's why I said at the time that we started this yeah, yeah. state of the art, that was available in our um, Yeah, because so I think it's probably late 2017 that we started. So I know that Frank has had the stuff on, you know, Rust for, I mean, because uh, materializes is effectively, I think, what we did for his, his timely data flow system in Rust at the core engine. So we probably could have compared against that. But 100%, that would use less memory. It would be better in its plans. And the second work, we maybe could have done it 
uh, our, as a comparison, we probably should look at it as a good comparison now, especially with what they have with materialize. Uh, the main difference is they're just trying to go as fast as possible, right? So like, um, but 100% that would be a good thing to poke at. And as we go forward, I, I think we need to kind of see how do they do and how, how, how good are they doing at their intelligence selection? It, it'd be a better baseline for our next paper um, that we, we haven't we haven't beat up on them. Especially now that we're going to Rust too. So now we should have the same kind of execution environment. So. But great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. And especially, you know, they've been, yeah, they, they had this paper at this last uh, Sigma or VLDB that was about kind of like shared query execution in a similar context. Uh, they're basically building indexes on kind of data flow stuff with um, guy from Brown um, blanking on names. It's too early in the morning here. Great. Um, awesome. Any other questions on IQP? So Aaron, um, so you, I'm, I'm not sure if the last graph you showed captured this, but you know, it seems like, so, so maybe I should ask first, uh, you said test 99% data in the first execution. What did you mean by that? We assume that like we, we did, we've already executed the query when I had 99% of the data, I've done the work and I kept the state around or whatever, right? So if it's, if it's VB toaster or disk, I ran that query on 99% of the data and now I, and I've kept whatever I need to keep. And now I'm saying, oh, there's one more percent data, right? So 100% of the data is the full TPCH scale factor 10 or whatever it was on this curve. Oh, okay. So okay. yeah. So I guess I was going to ask, I mean, you, know, you, you kind of need some think time, right? It seems, so to speak, right? Between different data um, arrivals or, you know, you need some arrival rate that will allow you to have some think time. So. What happens if your, you know, input data rate is, you know, like it's coming in at a high rate continuously versus, you know, giving you think time? Yeah, this is that uh, good. Oh, the next work probably is a little bit more on this. This really is targeting this case when you know that like the data is not coming in fast. Um, you know, so if this data was coming in fast, our our, our uh, optimization here does have some slowness to it. So like, and if it was coming in fast and it was changing a lot, right? If it was coming in fast, but it was coming at the same rate, you in theory could use the same thing, but the amount of work that you would do here probably would not be ideal in this context. Um, I don't think we had any experiment where we, we cranked up the, the ingest rate and saw what happened here. Um, I imagine at some point in time, the speed, you know, like somebody said, depending on, on the workload, there's going to be a crossover point where something like VB Toaster would do better at it, right? Like it's just doing a better job at incorporating those records. Uh, but the, the next one is a little bit more in that kind of CQ environment. So I think okay. this next one is what can we, maybe what would we do if we had kind of faster ingest rate? How would we exploit information doing something different? Okay, cool. Good, great, thanks. thanks. Okay. So great, I'll jump on uh, just in the sake of time. So great, all right, so we got about 15 minutes. Okay, good. So this next one is going to be incremental uh, aware execution or NQP, I might call it. And this just appeared at this past Sigma here. So again, in this world of, you know, we have latency, we wanna shorten the latency. And the way of shortening the latency is usually some form of eager or incremental computation where I take the data that I have, I do some work before the result's ready. And then when I have all of the data, I basically figure out how to repair that result or incorporate the rest of the data into there. Right. And once we're even in incremental execution, there's this question of how eager should I be? Should I be lazy? Maybe do it twice? Should I do it four times? And basically, as you do more eager execution, you shrink that latency more and more, but potentially at the cost of doing more and more work. And why is this more and more work? Well, one key insight here is that incremental execution can introduce wasted work. So imagine I have this simple query here where I'm trying to say, you know, get me the customers who have a balance greater than the average balance. So I, I go through, I calculate my initial results eagerly, and then I get some new customer data that comes through, right? And what's happening here is with this new customer that comes in is it changes the balance. And because it changes the balance, I have to remove some results that shouldn't, that shouldn't be there anymore. And I should go back and find records that should now potentially be included in it, you know, depending if the balance goes up and down. So there's a lot of extra work that has to be, re, be redone if I'm incrementally maintaining this type of query right here. And so here I go through, I find these new records, I remove records, I add new records and so forth. And, and so this goes back to this trade-off of you know, latency and resource consumption. And here I'm gonna say total work. Total work goes back to this question, this conversation with Ken earlier about like, you know, we're gonna say this is basically a proxy that would relate to dollars. It's basically what is the units of work that the cost model is doing. Right? And so there's this trade-off curve here. And this trade-off curve is, is going to be shaped differently depending on the query. 
Some queries are going to be very amenable for incremental execution and some are not. So like this case where I have things that are changing and because things are changing, I have to go back and redo a lot of work. These queries are going to have basically as you get more and more eager to drop off this query, I'm going to consume a lot more work. If I change that query to say, instead of the balance, I say, give me the balance is higher than seven. Well, then it's awesome for incremental computation because I don't waste work as I do it. So the curve for that type of query would look much more sharp down, right? So here we're thinking about, you know, there's these different trade-offs in incremental computation. Can we exploit that? But in particular, it's not that the entire query waste work, it's one particular part of the query. So if we go back to this example, maintaining the average, if we're only considering inserts here, there's no wasted work. I get a record, I maintain that average, that's great. In the end, that average is valid. It's the finding, the joins that should satisfy that condition that introduces wasted work. So what we're going to do in this work is we're gonna say, can I take a query? Can I break it into this notion of a query path, you know, kind of like a sub query plan. And then based on its incrementability, you know, how eager or how amenable is it for incremental computation, I'm going to selectively put the work into the parts that are better incremental computation. So for this simple example, that I'll use a couple of times where I have A, B, and C, you know, the part A is super great for incremental computation. It's the B and the C that are less great for incremental computation. So here we're gonna say, break it into these paths. And these paths are basically going to be blocking operator to blocking operator, input to output, whatever, you know, there's these different permutations. And, and notable here that's different than a lot of systems is an operator can belong to more than one path because we can maintain like a join kind of asymmetrically. I can do the, the maintain the join from the customer table. I can maintain the join from the averages. So we're gonna basically break things down into these paths and we're gonna allow the execution to go differently. So this is what I'll call as MQP. So MQP says, take, give me a plan give me a performance objective and give me some, some how data is going to come in and I will figure out how to make things work. So imagine I have this data coming in, I have these three, these three paths, A, B, and C. And again, A is the maintaining of the average in this example. And here we're going to have a pace. Pace is basically going to be a number that as I turn up that number, it means go more frequent. And this is supposed to symbolize how many executions should this path do before the query is over. So if it's three, it means that we should execute this three times. So roughly for every third of records, we should go through and, and work on this part of the query. If it's one, that basically means batch, means wait till the bitter end and then execute all the data at the end. And so this is what it's going to look like. So this decomposed execution it differs than traditional systems like Spark or Flink, where you basically have one knob and you can kind of crank that knob up to say, go more eager, but you do everything more eagerly here. So if I said, basically run this whole plan with pace three, if this was Spark, it's basically tuning your mini batch size. You're basically for every chunk of data, you do the whole query plan. And so our goal here is to say, can we get to the same performance latency, but can we do much less work along the way, right? So somebody's trying to get to that latency number, but we want to do it and drop our work. And by dropping our work, we in theory are dropping cost or resource consumption. So our more formal problem statement is, if, assuming I have a way of decomposing this into query paths, can I find a query path that minimizes the total work, you know, the resources that are consumed, while meeting what we're going to call is the final work constraint. And the final work constraint is going to be basically be our proxy for latency. This is going to say, once I had all of the records, how much work you know, do I have to do to get the result? And that work's going to be, what is the, you know, the, the cost, the query plan say is the work, you know, if it's just tuples through the system, uh, whatever the cost, you know, the query plan optimizer fits out, that's it. But this is more or less a proxy for latency. So in QP works, we have this data arrival rate, we have a query, the query is the query, you know, the, the traditional SQL and what to run and our final work constraint. This final work constraint is, uh, again, I said this a little bit earlier, but it's gonna be this ratio of batch to, to final, we're not going to consider isolation. We're just going to uh, we're just going to assume that the query is run by itself. So if I gave the query as one, that's batch processing. If I wait until I have all the records and do it, this is how much work I have to do at the end. If you said I want to do half the work at the end, in theory, I want to cut the latency in half. I have to do some eager work, right? And so in this case, it's point three. So point three says do one third of the work that you do at the end, and I will do that by being more eager. And so it's going to bump up my total work or use more resource utilization. So this is this is the knob that we're going to give to the user. And that knob, with this information, we give the pace configuration, which is how do I basically execute the, the query parts in different ways. We do this with three things. We come up with this notion of incrementability, which is a way that we quantify the cost effectiveness of various incremental executions. I'll spend a little bit of time on that. 
We have a cost model that I won't get into too much today, but basically this is a way of how do I compute incrementability. And we have an optimization algorithm that basically says it's a search algorithm that more or less goes along and tries to find uh, what's the right pace configuration given these things. So I'm just gonna focus on the one for the sake of time. So let's think about incrementability for a single uh, pace. So if I just had this one knob for the entire query, what would incrementability look like? Again, think about this trade-off. I start off with it pace being one, which is batch, batch processing. The total work I do is the final work I do because I do nothing before I have all of the records. If I want this to go faster, I start to turn up that knob, which means I have to do more work eagerly. How basically good is our investment on eager work is what's going to help us think about incrementability. If my drop off was really like I do, I can cut the latency in half without a lot of extra work. That means that that query or that plan, that plan is good at incremental ex execution. If I cut my latency in half, but I have to do like four times as much work, that means that's not amenable for inc incremental execution. So what we're thinking about here is basically it's that ratio of final work versus the increase in total work is the insight for what's incrementability here. So here we're gonna think of this as you give me a pace con two pace configurations and we're gonna think about these two pace configurations, how much did I drop the end work or how much did I drop the latency over how much extra work did I do? That's our incrementability and that's this insight of how we're going to define incrementability. Now we don't have one pace, we have a pace configuration which is this decomposed query plan. So this is going to change a little bit. It's going to be uh, a pace configuration which is basically going to begin, we have these, these, these query paths and we give each path its number. Uh, we're going to have some requirement that B is more eager than A. So at least all of the paces are the same or greater. And there's at least one pace in B that's greater than the equivalent pace in A. And instead of just basically this decreased final work versus the increase in total work, we're going to think about it basically in between this pace configuration, what's the differences between their final work and what's the differences between their total work. So this is how we're going to define incrementability, and we use incrementability in a couple of ways to, to solve this problem. Uh, the cost model here is basically we take some work from uh, Jeff Naughton's group uh, from a while ago in stream processing. We extend our, our traditional cost optimizer to think about for each node, what are the inserts, updates, and deletes, and we use kind of a matrix. So if you give me a set of inserts, updates, and deletes for this operator, what do we expect to be how many insert updates and deletes are to come out of it? And this lets us reason about incrementability. So if you give me a bunch of inserts and I have to give you a bunch of updates or deletes, that tells me that that operator actually is not very incremental, right? We want it to be more monotonic. Uh, we use this cost model in a simulator to fig basically estimate, given some pace configuration in the, this current plan, can I tell you how expensive it will be, both in terms of total work and final work for a given pace configuration? And then we have a greedy search algorithm that basically starts off with everything at batch, and we use incrementability to figure out where should I basically turn the knobs at in this configuration, such that I can meet a performance goal if I can, and while meeting that performance goal, can I minimize my total work? I apologize if that's short, but it's, it's a little tight on time. So I'm just going to kind of have to wave through it. Happy to talk more about it after. So we're, we did implemented this in Spark, like I said before, data gets fed in using Kafka and we're gonna compare against our NQP and in this incremental oblivious baseline, which is just more or less uh, Spark SQL with the same optimizations that we have. And here we have one pace. Now, instead of just setting the pace based on what we want our target latency. So you can imagine that I want the latency to be cut in half, you just double your mini batch size. We actually end up using NQP's cost model to figure out how much should I set it because that does a better job than just kind of blindly setting the result. So the incremental oblivious approach is this uniform. It's going to use our same cost model to do it. We're able to do the full TPCH queries and we have two kind of hand rolled queries that, are, that kind of show the cases that's going to be. Uh, we use two different scales to kind of keep the memory pressure on, but to not overflow the memory. Uh, I'll show when that is. And basically, we have data coming in at one gigabyte a second, and we set our max pace uh, to be 100, which is basically how eager can we be. We set, we've set a max on the pace. So here, what I want to look at is a set of TBCH queries. And I'm going to right now to show basically how much extra overhead were there for those queries. So versus batch versus this eager execution, how much extra work did I do to get that basically lower latency? I'm going to look at these two baselines. Now, we had all the queries, but some of the queries, about half of the queries are great at incremental computation, so there's no differences. So I'm not going to show those right now. We tried to target the final work constraint of 0.02, which means give me 2% of the latency as if you were in batch. The cost model for certain cases says I can't do that. I can't get you to 2% given the max amount of uh, basically resources you're letting me consume. So in those cases, we fall back to 5%. And that, that comes out of the cost model here. So those are the stars. The queries that have the smaller scale factor are marked with the pound. And this is basically do you use line item or not. 
So I'll show in a second, but both approaches more or less do a good job at getting that target latency. And that target latency is 2% a batch or 5% a batch, depending if it has the star or not. What we want to show here is that we're able to get to that latency using much less CPU consumption. So how much total work or additional CPU time in this did I use versus batch? And here what we can see is that the red bar for NQP is much lower in certain queries, which means that to get to that low latency, we're getting there, but we're doing it with much less resource utilization. And in some cases like query 15, there's a max operator and that max operator it causes a lot of basically work to thrash because there's deletes that are happening here. So this is kind of a high level view. I'll dive into one particular query like I did last time that I think will illustrate it a little bit better. Our, our latency, how good do we do at doing the latency? Well, this is saying basically, what did I expect to get and how well did I do it? If we look at the two approaches, we both miss our target latency by about a second. On average, I'm sorry, on the median, we do about a second. Our average is about two seconds. The other one's about 10 seconds. And then the worst case, in this case, is query 15, we miss it by, uh, you know, sorry, the, the baseline misses it by 100 seconds and we miss it by eight seconds. So we're not doing a perfect job of getting the latency. I'll show it in a second, but we're doing a pretty good job. This, I think, does a better job of illustrating it with the last two minutes here. So Matt, we're going to look at one query, query 17, the two baselines. We're going to look at latency versus overhead, right? How much extra time did I get to do it? We start off with one, which is batch processing. And then we say, basically, if we go to the final work constraints 0.5, I want to cut the latency in half. And so getting that half would be you know, getting to about that 150 seconds from 100 seconds, which both of them do pretty good job at. What we want to see is that NQP is farther to the left. That means I got to that latency, but I did it with less extra work. right? And so as I turn, basically make my constraints smaller and smaller, what we're going to see is that both baselines do a good job of getting to that pace. But what we can see is that as we get down, we're able to do it by using much, much less extra CPU time. right? And this is really comes from the fact that we're able to exploit basically an understanding of what parts of the query are good at e eager incremental computation and what parts are bad. And by exploiting which ones are good, we put more of our resources there and less of the resources at the other part and basically try to defer that work to the end. We're trying to have this hybrid of eager and lazy, but be selective in what we're doing. So this is NQP. We take this notion of a performance goal, this query plan, this incremental ability, and we try to say, can I get you to your target latency? And can I do so by using less work? Can I be smarter about the work that I'm doing and re reduce my resource consumption? Or if you were in a pay per use model, reduce the amount of money that you're spending to get to there. And I think that we do a pretty good job of doing that. I'm going to wrap up and then I'll take questions on NQP. So we have these two cases that I talked about. They have slightly different scenarios. One's a little bit bursty, the other's more kind of CQ ish. One's trying to figure out saving memory when I'm down, the other one's trying to figure out when I'm running, can I be better about what I run? Right now, this new kind of prototype we're building, like I said in Rust, we're trying to put these two things together and smash them together and figure out what we can do. There's a lot of stuff I skipped today, figuring out basically if I had views, what should I maintain? We had some work on lazy data loading. We had some other work on figuring out other what views to select. And those kind of components at the bottom I talked about. It's clearly uh, is done with a large team. We've, we think it's an exciting uh, vision. And this is done you know, with myself, Mike Franklin, Sanjay, a few students, one who just graduated, and uh, an intern from uh, Peking. So that's it. I'm happy to open up with questions for the last minute, or if people want to stick around longer, I will be here. But thanks. And the awkward virtual silence, you know, thanks. Great. <laughs> uh, Zooms. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll virtually applaud for, <laughs> for everybody. Okay. So um, if people have questions, probably the easiest thing is just unmute yourself and ideally, you know, turn your camera on if you're willing and um, go ahead. Anybody? I mean, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask one um, and then if uh, it'll give people a chance to think if they have any others. Um, so the, the NQP stuff that you talked about at the end. So I, I know that the target setting that you had in mind is this kind of continuous arrival of stuff and you kind of, you defined your you know, latencies for that setting. So what I was trying to think about during, while you were talking was kind of whether this is relevant at all if you have all the data ahead of time, like normal query processing. Is there some kind of trade-off that this is exposing there that matters, you know, just if, I, if I have all the data sitting there? No, I don't think so. Because I think if you had all the, the data, assuming that your optimizer is right, it, it doesn't do anything. It, 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 like the plan that the, the batch system should do in theory should be ideal for it. Right. The, the whole thing that we're exploiting by the data coming in is that some okay. result that you generate 
might not actually contribute in the end. Okay. Yeah. So like it's not in a in the traditional system, like you would never calculate the average and then kind of eagerly start working on the join, right? You would wait till you had that average before you'd start doing the join, right? That's that blocking versus non-blocking operator, right? If you were to decompose it, maybe I had like a bunch of cores and I'm trying to maybe then do opportunistic execution, then maybe, right? right. Like why why wait have these cores be idle when I could start them? That would be the one case, but then if you squint, it's the same thing, right? It's a CQ system. It's just like what data have I processed versus what data haven't I processed. Okay. It's an interesting question though. Maybe you could come up with cases where you could say, yeah, I could be actually eager here or opportunistic because I believe okay. that I can start this join. But yeah. I'll have to see if I can think of a sort of a concrete example to, to sort of um, make this a little clearer, but okay. Yeah. yeah. And anybody else questions? So, oh, um, yep. um, so, so, you know, one of the reasons to go to more of a batched execution model, right, um, for systems in general is to try to um, achieve higher throughput, right, while trading off for latency. Um, so you, you showed some numbers there for latency. Um, is there a notion of throughput you could use um, to figure out like, you know, what your performance would be um, for throughput or does the model really make throughput not a viable, you know, uh, metric to use? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um... Yeah, I don't think we ever even considered throughput in this, right? I think the thing that the throughput might matter is if you had some form of back pressure, or you could potentially drop records if it wasn't being ingested at the right rate. Um, that, that would be my gut feeling, but I, I don't think we even considered throughput. Like, I think we just always thought about latency as, as the right measurement for this uh, because it's the time to get the result, not necessarily how many records do I flow through the system. But I would guess that there is a strong correlation with, you know, I mean, it probably depends on how you want to count throughput, right? Is it a record that you process that contributed to the end, right? But that's because that's the whole thing of incrementability, right? Like I process some record, does that record count at the end or not? So if, if throughput was just like records that you ingest, like, you know, that process through the system, you, your numbers would be off. If you looked at throughput in terms of like, some, somehow normalized by the amount of records at the end, it might be interesting. But yeah, I, I, it's a good question. I, I would have to think that it would have to have, it would depend on like, yeah, I only have like, you know, if we had a Kafka source and that Kafka source had to basically kick things out at a certain rate, and if not, I'd drop things on the floor, like load shedding, then it probably would matter. But I, I don't think we thought about that in, at all. Okay. Yeah, 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 it's a good question. Yeah, yeah that, that would have been a good question as Dishan during his thesis. <laughs> I could say, uh, <laughs> it's the thesis defense. It's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's great. Yeah. I, I, we did not think about it. Yeah, you also mentioned back pressure mechanism, right? So, you know, yeah. most systems will actually, the back pressure mechanism will kick in at some point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Particularly when there's memory stress. So yeah. I don't know if you saw that in Spark in your implementation or not, but. Yeah, he did a bunch of dirty hacks on it. I mean, he went through basically like Shivram Venkataraman's thesis and like implemented all these Spark optimizations to get things to go faster, query, you know, cache, query cache plannings, fast starts and things like that. Um, I don't think, you know, we were at the rate that we had to worry about it, it dropping off, but, you know, with Kafka as the source I, that might've punted on that a bit, right? Like, you know, he, he tuned that, that ingest rate at a rate that we were able to handle. So, so we, we, we probably masked something there. Thanks. Great. Anybody else? Hi, Erin. This is Sheet. Um, yeah. Thanks very much for the very interesting talk. I just I'm um, curious about what do you think about the future of Crocodile DB? Are you good? Do you have plan to commercialize it, or do you think the techniques used in Cro Crocodile DB will be are uh, used in some of their existing commercial cloud systems? What do you think? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I would, you know. Starting a commercial startup around a database core execution engine seems like one of the worst things in the world <laughs> after seeing some companies. <laughs> this is the amount of things you have to build to make people happy. So I, I, I the hope is maybe that some, you know, I like building things, but I don't want to build things to like where we have to support customers. <laughs> this is a different game. Yeah, the hope is that maybe somebody could think about, you know, we did think about like, could you take this tool 
hook it into a system like Spark or like kind of something on a cloud platform and then maybe take the incrementability and just expose on like an existing system, could you expose that trade-off? That might have more impact or allow people to work on it in a tangible. But I think once you start ripping apart the query engine, everyone gets nervous, right? <laughs> like no one wants to touch it and everything. So um, yeah, it would take a lot of money and a long amount of time to do that. So I, I don't think we're going to build it to that level, but we do want to build something that works. But yeah, but throwing away like durability, right? Is it makes life so much better when you're building systems. <laughs> but yeah, that's a great question. Thanks. Thanks. And and Ken's old talk on you know we want the what was it you had the thing on like adjustable durability, right? Everyone was like think about adjustable isolation. I'm like yeah, I like to crank that durability knob down and go. <laughs> like, yeah. All right. Not hearing anybody else. So thanks again, Aaron, for doing this and uh, for